Well, hey, church, uh, we wanted to have an informal discussion today on corporate worship. Uh, this is something that Pastor John Mark and I talk about regularly. Uh, it's very important biblically throughout church history, and we spend a lot of time talking about this, thinking about this, and wanted today to just bring you into sort of a public discussion on corporate uh, worship. And so Pastor John Mark has been encouraged by some inside and outside of the church sort of to speak into uh, corporate worship, at, as, uh, particularly the, the cross church's corporate worship, and just speak into that vision and, and say a few things. And I wanted to just see if we could get together today and maybe articulate a clear vision, not theologically so much for corporate worship, yes, we want to talk about that, but particularly corporate worship at the cross church. And so we wanted to just have that discussion today. And so uh, what kind of led up to this conversation? Maybe speak into that some. Yeah. So uh, Sunday, I uh, had a meeting with the singers and musicians at the church, um, had a hour and a half or so discussion. I uh, think it was profitable. They found it to be helpful and encouraged me to broaden it and, and speak more broadly to, uh, to the church. I was speaking to a church planner yesterday about these type matters, so hopefully others can hear some of this maybe as well. Um, yeah, so I think that that's what sprung this about. Sure, and so we want to get into a lot of those particulars, but we know that theology has to fuel, uh, orthodoxy has to fuel orthopraxy, right? So we don't want to just jump into the practicalities right away. So could you, brother, just what is a biblical basis, a theological basis for corporate worship? I think it would be good to start there. Yeah, no, that's a great place to start. So corporate worship is not optional uh, for the Christian life. Uh, the Bible just doesn't allow for there to be a Christian life apart from singing with God's people. Uh, there's over 400 mentions of singing in Scripture, uh, numerous commandments, hundreds of commandments, uh, all within the context of a corporate gathering to sing together. I don't even know if there's one that you could find that's just singing alone. Uh, there, it all implies a togetherness and singing. And so um, that that's just must be in the old covenant and the new covenant factored into uh, God's people's lives and ordering our lives around singing. Um, and so if, 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 uh, if a Christian doesn't desire to sing with the people of God, something's seriously wrong in their heart. Uh, this is, this is uh, something of uh, part of what it means to be regenerate is to love the people of God, to want to sing with them and to them and to the Lord together. Um, and, and so uh, now I don't think that means everybody equally likes singing or, or enjoys this particular ministry, just as some ministries are more loved and appreciated by some than others. But uh, and it doesn't mean we're all equally good at it um, and that we don't have to work and, and grow into this. But I know for for uh, for Christian parents, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do with our children and many in our church is really just create the whole world they live in is a world that they sing every day. So, so our kids start their day off every day singing uh, with their school and then they're being trained in school, but then they come home and we sing together as a family. And then we have city groups during the week where we sing. Uh, we'll have people over and we'll sing together. We're singing on, on the Lord's day, obviously. So uh, this just becomes such a normal part of the Christian life. Um, but it's not normal for many who are converted later or who grew up in certain homes where maybe uh, they were sent early on to a children's ministry or a youth group setting and it was ver largely a spectator type thing and maybe uh, not emphasized at all. And so the he heavy emphasis on singing would seem abnormal uh, to, to many. Um, but, but historically and biblically, um, we'd argue that it has to be central in our Christian life. Yeah, that's good. And it's, there's so many things we could talk about here. You know, you think about Paul and Silas, right, being thrown into prison. Mm -hmm. What do they do? They sing, they sing that's right. hymns. That's right. Right. They sing psalms, and uh, they had to have had those memorized, right? You, Jesus and his disciples were singing hymns. You know, there's so many different apl applications of singing within the scriptures. It just seems to be so central to who we are as the people of God. Absolutely. Um, I was thinking, you know, James uh, chapter five, verse 13, it says, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing. 
And so singing is an expression of joy. Um, If you're cheerful, sing, but it also leads to joy. So sometimes we're not cheerful, we don't have joy, and therefore we should sing. And often our emotions will catch up to our obedience, to obey the command, to sing with joy, to rejoice. Um, And so many times Christians reverse those and think, well, I don't feel like singing, therefore I, I don't. And what we should do is obey the command to sing and then let it provoke our emotions in the right direction. Um, and, and so uh, James 5 is helpful there. And many of the Psalms that talk about joy in connection with singing, um, you know, spiritual warfare, uh, you know, fighting spiritual battles with song is actually something in Scripture that's emphasized more than most realize. Um, Ephesians 5, you see this connection with Ephesians 5 and, and Ephesians 6. It says, uh, it talks about singing together corporately, and then it talks about warfare right after that. And there is a connection there with how that's built out. Many of the battles in Israel's uh, history that they won, they won through song. And even after the battle, they would sing. And, uh, and so warfare connected to singing is a really interesting thing that needs to be explored and discussed more. Um, But even uh, it's hard to live in unrepentant sin if you're singing with thankfulness in your heart to God, which is what the command says. Um, So singing has a way to sanctify a believer, to to purge them of ungratefulness or uh, bad heart postures and to realign their affections uh, Godward. Um, It's evangelistic, you know, Um, Psalm 105 talks about uh, the need to be a light to the nations, that God's people are a light to the nations. And then within that psalm, it says to sing to him as a testimony to the nations of his goodness. So there's an evangelistic aspect to corporate singing. Um, And then I think the biggest one is just in the corporate setting, um, the ministry of singing in the local church. Um, which is emphasized in Colossians 3, I believe, in Ephesians 5, uh, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another. So it's a one another ministry. That's good. And so I think that's mainly in this video what we want to talk about or in this discussion is the maybe the horizontal nature of corporate worship. Obviously, like you just said, as a Christian, it is natural to sing. It's natural for the new created inward man to want to express that thankfulness and that joy to God. Uh, But we see in the New Testament particularly this imperative to sing to one another, to build each other up, to admonish each other. And so we do that in our corporate worship services, and we do it um, in such a way that we want to be faithful to those texts, right? And we also want to receive all that God has for us through the ministry of singing, and so I want to get into that primarily today. Well, can I, let me say one thing on that. So there's a, a passage that says Colossians three sixteen. Let the word of of Christ dwell in you richly, singing, and then it has this one another ministry of singing. And so the connection between singing and the word of God dwelling in us richly. So we often would say, well, we need to study the Bible and memorize the Bible if we want the word of God to dwell in us richly, and that's true. But we also should memorize songs uh, that are Bible-based, truth-based, and even psalms in particular, memorize those in order to get the word of Christ dwelling in us richly. And I would say in terms of from from a a parental perspective, this is a primary way that we're getting the word of God into the hearts and minds of our children is by teaching them to sing um, and, and helping them memorize songs. That's great. And so I think it's just helpful to start there because... I think sometimes in our kind of 21st century church mindset, we can think of a church as a singing church, or maybe this church doesn't sing well, or this church likes to sing and this church doesn't, or these Christians like to sing and these don't, and that just doesn't seem to be a biblical option, right? This is so foundational to what it means to be a corporate entity, to be a corporate people of God, and to be Christian, that we have to grow in our theological understanding and our application of all these texts of singing. So that really kind of leads us into some more of the practical things that I'd like to get into regarding our church. So you planted the church back in 2008. So we're, we're 15 years old. We have a facility now, praise the Lord. Um, I imagine, uh, and I don't imagine, we've, we've, had, we've talked to many, many people, uh, new people maybe not so much because all they see is what 
they've come in with recently. But if you've been at the church for five, six, seven, or even longer than that, years, uh, you've noticed some, some transitions, some shifts. Some may even ask the question, why have we changed? They may even use that strong of a term, we have changed. And so what would you say, maybe, maybe step back and give us a broader context of the church's uh, journey in regard to doing corporate worship well. Yeah, so back to what you said before all of that, um, it's not optional for a church to grow in this area in the same way we want to grow in every area of our Christian life and every area of our corporate church life. We just have to grow in our singing. So what does that look like? What does that look like for any church to grow in how we sing? Does it look like for a band to just get better? You know, do you improve music quality? Like, what does that even mean to get better at singing? Well, it, I think it obviously means the congregation needs to get better at singing. It's the primary thing. And the, maybe the songs that they sing might need to improve. Um, so I think a church needs to step back and say, what does it even mean to grow in singing? We all have to do that. Every church should. And so for us, yeah, 15 years of growth, I mean, is in my mind what's, what's happened so when someone says, why have we changed? I would say we've grown. We haven't changed theologically. We haven't changed in terms of our vision. We've grown into what we've always believed. We always sang primarily hymns, but at least lyrics that matched our theology and the depth of our theology, which maybe we can talk about more in a minute. Um, and then, uh, and then we've, uh, but stylistically, maybe there's been some changes and, and I would agree with that. And I think that that is true. And I'd be happy to, to talk more about that. But I think when it comes to the, the, the method in which we, re, which we see the lyrics that we're singing, whether it be a screen or on a written uh, piece of paper, uh, that's changed. And then maybe stylistically, there's been some changes. But fundamentally, we haven't changed at all in our approach to singing in the last 15 years. Right. And I think the, the big thing, if you're a member of the Cross Church, or you've been attending for the past six months or so or, or a year, the big shift I think that people have noticed is that we're no longer singing from a projector, right? right? And, and obviously our projector went out uh, however many months ago, and there were all sorts of practical and pragmatic discussions about projector, money, stylistically, does it even fit, does it work, all, all of those things, the room. But all those things aside, right, we, we could get a new projector and we could right. make it work, yeah. right? We could do that. Uh, so someone might ask, Singing with a projector just seems easier. It seems more convenient. It just seems like people can sing uh, easier and, and with more freedom. Uh, they've got both of their hands free. They can look up. It just seems that a projector enhances singing and makes it easier and better. What would be your response to that? Um, I, I would first of all agree that uh, for many, especially in our generation, where projectors is kind of what we've been trained with, uh, it is it is the easy option. Um, it is definitely the easier option. Um, so I wouldn't. I would certainly wouldn't want to argue argue about that. Um, and I wouldn't say a, a projector is a matter of sin or something like that. I don't think it's sinful or wrong to have a projector. Uh, so so those things aside, and and agreeing on the simplicity of it, I think what I've said to people um, privately on this question, I've I've said. You know, to, to, for example, to someone who has small children and the idea of a projector it seems to make the worship setting much easier and they're struggling holding a, a small child or having small children there. Um, I've said, think 20 years, you know, think about what is best for your family for the next 20 years, not for this immediate moment where things are difficult in a worship service what's going to be best for your family for the next 20 years? Because that's how I'm thinking. That's how we're thinking uh, about this issue is the whole totality of this family's time in our church, uh, not just that moment where it's hardest to be in corporate worship, whether there's a screen or not, right? Um, and so I, I think that's something that needs to be understood in terms of how we're thinking through this. Um, you know, maybe to get super practical with it, uh, Looking up at a screen or looking down at a bulletin, neither are good goals to have. The church should not aspire to just look at a screen nor to just stare at a bulletin. The goal would be to memorize the song and, and just look at the church, 
maybe close your eyes and, and have a moment with the Lord, but certainly not to be looking up or down. And so like on Sunday, I'm sitting down here and my eyes hit the paper once or twice for a few seconds. Other than that, my eyes were closed and I was looking around the congregation. Um, I think that's ideal. I memorized those songs. And so um, I think that's what we want uh, to do. And we can maybe say say a few few more things about that in a minute. But um, with with looking around being the goal, we turn the lights on on Sunday mornings. Uh, we don't turn them off because, again, it's a ministry to the church. You really, and I'm going to come back to this because this is really part of the vision is the being able to see each other. Um, and so, yes, if someone says, I don't, I don't, we shouldn't look down and just sing into the floor. I would say, you're right. We shouldn't. And even if you have to look at the lyrics, you should still hold them up so that you can project outward. You know, you hold your bulletin up. And so there, there are certainly things that we can grow in and implement this better. You know, another thing about, um, singing from music that's a that's an added benefit is uh how the body of christ is formed you know jesus uh, paul talks about in first corinthians uh the body having many parts and each part playing its role and every part being significant and you think about when you're singing a hymn that has multiple parts you know i can't sing the high part so i might back off for a minute and someone else sings that high part and then someone else can't get the low part, but I can. And, and, and so people singing different parts are filling in and the body of Christ is creating this beautiful, uh, this beautiful song with everybody playing their part. And so, and the same with adding instrumentality and, and parts. And, and so that's not just a Reformed Baptist thing. That's not like a traditional thing. That goes back 3,000 years, this type of stylistic togetherness and complementarity in singing. And then you add instrumentality to that, and it's a, it's a, it's a corporate uh, creation as worship to God. And, uh, and so it's hard to accomplish that just looking at lyrics on a screen. Um, much more possible to grow up into that when you have real music before you. Um, you know, one of the things contextually to our church that's important, I think, for people to understand is, I, I, I can do the math on this again, but I'm, I'm quite sure there's at least 24 family units that have children that are being trained in how to read music, whether they're taking music lessons or they're in schools that are classically training them to read and sing music correctly, to play music correctly. And so when you think about the second generation of this church, and there may be, and, and that's not just, that's 24 family units. So that may be 60 kids or more uh, that are being trained to read music right now. So if, if all the adults go, we don't like music, we don't know how to read music. Well, that may be true, but what about the second generation that we're raising up? You know, let's, let's think bigger about this than just what's most convenient in this moment for us. That's a really helpful thing. I think another, one, one other thing on the, the projector, uh, you know, sheet music uh, issue is that um, uh, the whole uh, singing, not just being 20, 30 minutes on Sunday, but this is something that we want to be happening all through our week. And so if, if we are able to sing really well corporately together and even read music, ideally, although I don't believe everybody in the church will always be able to do that, nor should even have to do that. Um, but if there's a growth in singing from in, in that context at an excellent level, it translates into the home for family worship. It translates into city group. It translates into a lot of other places. But if all you can do is just sing from a projector, can you, are you going to sing in the home? Are you going to sing in these other places? And so you're really limiting yourself on your ability to, uh, to sing in other settings it becomes more uh, unnatural. Yeah, I think of it just a couple of practical stumbling blocks. You know, you you turn on a, a YouTube video to sing in corporate worship, and there's a an ad for 30 seconds with some kind of ungodly thing on there. That that's not a reality when you pull out your hymn, your hymnal, sure, or your bullet, yep. or your bullets in. And I think even uh, as you were speaking about, we're training our children to read to read music. There's somewhat of a contradiction to be to be training our children to do that, to be able to play instruments, to be able to sing well, and then bringing them in here and kind of flipping the switch and mm -hmm. having this sort of modern 21st century 
uh, convenient kind of worship. Mm. There, there's an inconsistency that our kids are seeing there yeah. um, that, that I, I'm not sure that we've thought through super deeply. So all of that just resonates really nicely. Yeah. I think another thing, and maybe you could speak into this a little bit more, singing well in corporate worship is a, is a fundamental aspect of the Reformed tradition, and particularly Reformed yeah. Baptist tradition. Yeah. So sp- speak into some of that. Are, are, are other Reformed Baptist churches that are really healthy, are they singing uh, the way we're arguing for today? Mm-hmm. Have, have the Reformers throughout history sung the way we're arguing for today? Right. Um, so you're going to be hard pressed to find a church that sings really well corporately who's dependent on a screen. I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm just looking for that example because I haven't even seen an exception to the rule. It seems that the general rule is any church that's really good at corporate singing is not using projectors. They're either singing from a hymnal or from sheet music and they've put some real labor into it and they've, they've chosen the hard path that uh, of, of not being dependent on those technologies. I mean, if you look at uh, named churches, Mark Dever at Capitol Hill Baptist, you look at John MacArthur at, at Grace Community, you look at John Piper, you look at uh, Tim Keller, you look at R.C. Sproul, you, any, of the, any of the men that people know their names that have, uh, have had uh, Reformed churches in the Reformed Protestant tradition don't use projectors. And certainly not historically, if we go to the Spurgeons and all the, you know, the men of old. Um, and so it's just a new invention that made things easy. People got dependent on it. But it, it, it would be hard to argue that it's best for good corporate singing. The, the opposite seems to be true. No, I, I agree. And I think leading into another really important part of the conversation, um, I've got a few thoughts on this, is just the difference between modern worship and, and corporate worship biblically and throughout the history of, of the church and particularly the, the Reformed church. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like night and day, mm. right? Um, so many um, churches today and so much of modern evangelicalism is built on this man-centered approach yeah. to corporate worship where there's this amazingly talented singer that kind of does all the work and then a few backup singers that do the rest of the work, and then the congregation, you just kind of do what you want, right? Yeah. You have your own time with the Lord or not, or you just kind of sit there and you're a part of the, the process. Mm-hmm. And these churches you just mentioned, there's been more thought into what are we actually doing mm-hmm. and how do we do it well to the glory of God. And there has to be, it seems to me, there has to be a buy-in from the church to say, yes, this is something that we're going to there's going to be some pains early on. Yeah. There's going to be some growing pains. There's going to be some bumps and bruises. But we are willing for the sake of the end goal, put in the work. 20-year vision, 40-year yeah. vision, to put in the work and to really enter into corporate worship with a mindset of, I'm going to sing to the glory of God. I'm going to sing because He saved me. And I'm yeah. going to sing to my brothers and sisters. Yeah and build them up. This isn't just about me and my preferences and my feelings. That's the key I've got to deny all that. And and I'm going to worship vertically, yes. Yeah, yeah. But I'm also doing this for the church. Yeah, this is is vital. I mean, I think this is the crux to the matter is the the radical individualism in in corporate worship settings. You know, like uh, someone going, I don't, I don't, that sermon just wasn't good. Well, why was it not good? I didn't get anything out of it. It's like, well, what if everybody else in the room did? Is it still a bad sermon because you didn't get anything out of it? Um, I mean, this is how people approach music too. Well, I, I don't really like that. I mean, is that is that the point that you liked it? You know, that you felt something like, is does it honor the Lord? Is it edifying to others? Are you actually ministering to others? I mean, there's just the the difference between an individual approach to corporate worship, I mean, it is called corporate worship for a reason. <laughs> um, and then the difference in saying, I'm entering into a corporate setting, and this isn't about just me right now. I, I want to be edified, but I'm largely edified by how I bless and minister to others and how they bless and minister to me. But But it's an exchange. And liturgy in corporate worship means the work of the people. And you're, you, you do need to come in and do some work. It, it isn't just receiving an, a felt experience, which is largely what the modern worship movement has done, is turned everything inward 
and made it all about do I get you know the right type goosebumps and do I leave feeling encouraged as the measure of if the worship was Christ honoring or biblical or and so so that that issue I think uh, is very problematic and so if somebody comes from that type mindset and then steps in to a reformed church not our church alone but any type of church that's really focusing on a corporate vision for 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 uh for singing is going to feel some things that uh like this feels stale or this feels like overly it feels like work you know it feels like they want me to do something that i don't feel like doing um i mean have you had that experience even coming out because i know your background uh wasn't in this tradition yeah you know it's interesting um coming out of more of a charismatic background where where music is like the thing like a lot of thought and a lot of time is put into the to the music aspect and uh you know there is the the environment really that's no holds barred right um the music begins to play and and anything really can happen in some of those settings <laughs> there there's in a lot of there's a lot of emotional uh reaction in, in a lot of in a lot of that and so when we came to the church in 2017, you know, we loved the preaching. We loved the intentionality of the pastors, and, and we just loved the church. Mm-hmm. But I think the one difficulty we had was the corporate music, mm-hmm. the corporate singing. And, and it wasn't because the music was bad. We loved the songs, and it right. wasn't because we thought the band was bad. It was very much we, we struggled with the what you just said, maybe the staleness or the low enthusiasm mm. of the congregation. Mm. Um, and I remember, you know, saying to my wife those years ago, you know, if these same songs were sung at the previous church we were at, you would see some really odd things happening because people would have just exploded with, again, I think wrong, wrongly, mm. oftenly, emotion, but they would have had emotion, Yeah. right? Yeah. And, and I think we struggle... And I think we still need to grow here as Absolutely. a church. Um, yeah. We're reformed. We love theology. We love the Bible, spirit, and truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there is a sense in which uh, we need to grow, I think, uh, as, as a church, just speaking very candidly to our people, we need to grow in expressing gratitude yes. and love to the yes. Lord. Uh, he sees us, yeah. right? He sees the way we worship. He sees the effort we give. He knows what's in our hearts, mm-hmm. right? If we if we come in like cynical, skeptical, yeah. um, you know, you and I, I, I catch you looking over and, and you'll see me looking over and turning around and looking at people, mm-hmm. right? Um, if that's offensive to people, if, it, if, they, if they don't like that because it makes us uncomfortable, uh, I think some of this, we, we really need to grow in this attitude of joy, yeah. in this attitude yeah. of, Jesus is ruling and reigning. He's yes. saved me from my sins. He's washed me. Mm-hmm. And these are my blood-bought brothers and sisters. Amen. I am going to give effort, no matter how bad I feel, yeah. no matter how guilty mm-hmm. I feel, no matter how much I don't want to be here, yep. I'm going to sing my way out of it yep. and yep. give God the glory that He deserves through my, through my singing. Sing, sing my way out of it. I love, I love to think like that because I, I, you know, coming out of a bad week and then many people bring that bad week into that Lord's Day service, what should happen is you leave that bad week in the prior week and with Christ uh, and his finished work. And then you start a new week in corporate worship, which is the first thing we do in our, in our, the beginning of a new week. And you you work out of that, you sing out of that, and you you propel yourself with celebration into the week ahead with hope. And um, and I think just too many people are bringing in all of their all of their problems and struggles, which at some level we want to do, but not to the point where it kills our worship. Um, this is this is a celebratory service of worship to the Lord. Uh, who who's bled and died for us, who's sit, seated at the right hand of the Father. We have every reason to sing joyfully That's to the good. Lord. And part of the reason for this discussion is is we want to ease some of the, the tension, right? We want to answer some of the questions. We want to, to help people understand that we really are trying to create uh, a scenario in our corporate worship where we can be obedient to the commands of God. And so uh, maybe a, a, to push this a little bit further, you think about in the Old Covenant, 
um, the Aaronic priesthood and the Levitical priesthood was essential, yeah. right? And nobody could do that work except for the priests, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the high priest even had to be from Aaron's line and all of these things. But in the new covenant, we are all called priests right. unto God, right? Yes. We're a holy, a royal priesthood. Mm -hmm. um, and so you see that in the New Testament, there's very much this command to all the congregation to sing. And so maybe speak into some of the problems of being band-centered or, or even going beyond that worship leader-centered to the point to where three or four really talented people create this incredible environment and nobody else has to do anything. What's, what's wrong with that? Yeah, so I mean, this is getting back to what we were talking about a minute ago with um, just the modern... Uh, the modern vision for worship compared to like a congregational type vision. And in the modern vision, the only way it really succeeds is if you have really gifted, talented people at the front with a microphone. Um, and so going back to the history of our church was, I had only seen that, I had only really known that, but yet at the same time, I'm like, we need to be singing rich theological songs. So we take these rich songs of our heritage, hundred year old, few hundred year old songs, and we start singing those, but then we start relying upon certain gifted singers to put their own twist on it, to fit the key to their voice and all, and all the things that a modern style would do, because that's all we knew was that type modern. So it was like old, rich, powerful lyrics with these and thous, <laughs> But then, but then put with like a modern emphasis on the worship leader. So we would sing with that key that the worship leader could do or whatever. And, and then studying these things biblically and historically going, I don't think that's the best thing for the congregation. We should probably pick the key that works best for the congregation. And then the band should adjust to that or whoever's on stage. And, and so there's been this shift in the last four or five years in our church understanding the need for the congregation to be able to sing whatever we're singing and not even picking certain songs that the congregation can't sing um, just because a worship leader can sing it. Uh, and so, so that's a shift that's happened in our church. And I think people have felt some of that. Um, and it's a legitimate, it's a legitimate shift. And so one of, one of the things that I think I, I want to announce to the church in this video, um, part of our path working forward is, you know, for a num for at least a year and a half, we have had no worship leader, essentially. Like if you would have asked the people on the stage, who's the leader? We don't have one. Um, and it's actually, it's been a significant problem. It, I think it's affected our congregation more than I would prefer. I apologize to the to the church at whatever level this has affected anyone's worship, but we just didn't assign a worship leader to help lead the band who would then help lead the congregation. We play a leadership role in the, in the sense that we uh, are responsible before God with the song repertoire. You know, we're going to stand before God one day and give an account for what people say with their mouths and sing with their mouths in a corporate setting. That won't be on anyone but us uh, to be judged for that. So we lead in that regard, but in terms of helping the church practically sing the songs, we just haven't had a worship leader. We've just let people share that, and we've said the congregation needs to sing. The change that we're making, and I'm, this is an announcement as well, is that Ed Varela, has, we've asked him to step into that leadership role. He's qualified to do this. He's been doing this to, at some degree, and we've just kind of freed him up and asked him to step in fully to that role. And so he's officially our, our worship leader at this point, if we, could, if we want to call someone that. Uh, he'll be helping the band with organizing how music's done, and then he'll be taking more of a, a lead role to help us sing well and, and grow in our singing. And so I won't list off all Ed's credentials now, but they're extensive and he's well qualified for this. And he's already served us the last two years uh, from stage, helping us to sing better. And I, I think that's, that's going to be a, Ed is going to serve us well and help us to, to grow into a lot of the things we're talking about. Uh, that's really, it's really good. And it almost seems just natural, right? Because as our music, I think has, uh, transitioned and our singing has transitioned, like you said, over the last five years, there's definitely been more of a masculine feel to it, right? Mm -hmm. There's We've really emphasized men leading family worship at home mm -hmm. and men leading their families in 
corporate worship, yeah. right? And, and we've had men's uh, meetings and discipleship trainings and all of these things where we've been discussing this the last couple of years. Yeah. Thinking about Paul saying to Timothy, I desire that the men everywhere pray, lifting up holy hands without quarreling, men really leading out. And when that happens, when the church gets a vision for biblical manhood, that music is going to become or the corporate singing is going to feel much more masculine right. as the congregation led by men um, grows. And as, like you said, the band centered this kind of falls away. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just inevitable. Yeah. And so, brother, maybe as we wrap this video up, you know, we're all thinking through uh, our, our little ones now, uh, our congregation now, the, the uh, growing pains, the bumps and the bruises. And we're going to feel that. We've talked about that. But What's a good 20-year vision for our church with regard to corporate singing? Maybe speak into that some. Yeah, so somebody, somebody asked me this the other day. I'm going to back up even further than that question. I'll say that question in a second. Um, so the church that helped us start this church, Grace Life of the Shoals in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, uh, Jeff Noblet, the pastor there, 15 years ago, looked me in the face and said, John Mark, if you want a mature church, which is what you should aim for, uh, you need a 20-year vision. And so from that moment on, I'm like, I need a 20 year vision with like every single thing we do, not like, hey, we're going to arrive at some point, not even that we arrive at 20 years, but we at least can get to a level of maturity, maybe by God's grace in 20 years. Um, and so I think even looking forward now, 20 more years into the future, um, I'm trying to think in these big, these big uh, span of time type ways and how, because change doesn't happen fast and growth doesn't happen fast. And, um, and so I think some of the things I would want to emphasize is that we, we don't want to be overly, uh, dependent on instrumentality, although we want to grow in instrumentality. You know, the, the Bible talks about loud clashing cymbals, stringed instruments, shouts of praise. Like there's a lot of things that the Bible explicitly calls us to in our singing that we haven't really grown into yet. So I think there needs to be a lot of growth when it comes to corporate aspects of how we celebrate the Lord in song with instruments, but then also sometimes just drop out all of that and just sing all voices. Right. And someone's just playing piano and leading us. And we're just all voices in our whole set list. I would love us to not be dependent on either and just be able to have the flexibility to just sing to the Lord regardless. Um, so that's that's a point of growth um, that, I, that I would really love to sing. The Psalms are something we do have a few Psalms that we regularly sing. We we have one hundred and fifty Psalms that God's given us uh, as a song book in, in, in the Bible. We need to be singing a lot more of those. When we expand our repertoire, which is something we talk a lot about, um, thinking of a, a church's song repertoire, like right now our church knows less than 100 songs. That's a really small repertoire. I know churches that have 500 songs memorized. 500. Um, we, we need to grow in our song repertoire. So if you think of like a song repertoire as a systematic theology book, we have a very small one right now with only a few categories. We want to broaden that to where we have a few hundred songs that have many songs on suffering, many songs on God's judgment, which the Psalms talk a lot about, many Psalms, uh, songs on all these different uh, vast array of, of biblical topics. And we've, we just, we've got a lot of work to do to get there. We, we don't want to try to change everything overnight. It's going to be a long, uh, a long road ahead to grow into that. But that is the 20-year vision. And the last thing I would say, brother, is right to the heart of the vision is, I want to walk into, and I want someone to walk into this church, and the thing that they're looking forward to all week, maybe more than the preaching, at least as much as the preaching in the table, is I need to sing with the church and be sung to. They look forward to coming in to sing, because the, the power of God is at work in the singing through the ministry of the body. It's a word ministry of the church. And so as we sing the truth of God into the soul of our brother or sister, for people to be in tears, people to come in here after just going through terrible suffering and to be ministered to through song in the corporate setting. I know many people have never actually been in a church that did that really, really well. 
I've actually been in a church that's done that incredibly well and it's life changing. It, you, you don't walk out of there having the same idea of what it means to sing corporately. We haven't achieved that yet. We're working toward that. There are churches that are there. And so a 20 year vision looks like singing so well together that it becomes extremely edifying to experience and for a non-believer to enter into and have the testimony of many saints testifying to the gospel of, of the grace of Christ uh, through song. So that, that's the vision, brother, and Lord help us to persevere and, and, uh, and grow and be patient with each other in the process. Yeah, so good. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, we just wanted to make this video and have this discussion uh, please uh, reach out to us if there's more clarification needed, if you have questions, if you have concerns. I think our hearts, more than anything, are just to have an environment where worship is, we can freely worship the Lord. Yeah. We can serve Him, we can serve one another, we can love each other, and we don't want there to be any obstacles to that, whether Amen. we're singing from a projector or, uh, or a hymnal or a bulletin or whether we just have it memorized, yeah. um, we just want to have an environment where we worship well and sing well. Amen. And so uh, reach out to us if you need yeah. to, but if not, God bless you. Blessings.